so our first talk is going to be by Dr. Sanjeev Chopra, who is from Beth Israel Deaconess in Boston, talking about exemplary leadership lessons from great leaders. And everybody's very anxious to, to hear this talk. Thank you uh, so very much. Good morning, everyone. I'm going to speak about a topic, a subject that's fascinated me for as far back as I can remember. And if I ask you to conjure up images of great leaders, great leadership moments from the pages of history or contemporary times, who comes to mind? What stories resonate for you? You hear the word great leader? Churchill. Churchill. Who else? Lincoln. Lincoln. Who else? Nelson Mandela. Mahatma Gandhi. So I've had the good fortune of giving this talk perhaps more than a hundred times, different iterations around the country and abroad. And every single time, this is the exact response. We tend to think of political, historical figures. Sometimes people will bring in religious figures, Jesus Christ, Moses, maybe the new pope. And the point I want to make is that each one of us can lead, and we can lead in exemplary ways. There is nothing in the DNA of certain people who are destined to be great leaders, and the rest of us to be clueless. So all great leaders, by their sense of purpose, their passion and their accomplishments, live a great story. And then those stories are told by historians, they're told by their followers, and they resonate in all the lands. They can do so for decades, even centuries. We don't have to be from South Africa to be in awe of Nelson Mandela. You don't have to be from the subcontinent of India to say Mahatma Gandhi, what an inspirational leader. So over the years, I've taught a lot of medicine and hepatology and often used mnemonics, alliterations, limericks. And I came up with the following mnemonic for leadership. And as you can see, it spells out the word leadership. I'm going to make the case that great leaders listen. They listen with heart and soul. They have empathy and compassion. They have an attitude that is upbeat and courageous. They dare to dream big. They're effective. They're resilient. They have a sense of purpose. They have humility. They also often have humor. They have great integrity. They have wild ideas. They have imagination. And finally, they pack other people's parachutes. And I'm going to tell you a story about Captain Charlie Plumb and packing other people's parachutes. So the first attribute, great leaders are great listeners. Susan Hockfield became the president of MIT some years ago, and she turned to her mentor, Richard Levin at Yale, and said, give me advice. And he said, I have three pieces of advice for you. Listen, listen, and listen. So great leaders, listen. This is a wonderful anonymous quote, although I was told recently in a foreign country, that this may in fact be a Kurdish proverb. It says, listen a hundred times, ponder a thousand times, speak once. Oliver Wendell Holmes at Harvard once said, it is in the province of knowledge to speak. It is in the privilege of wisdom to listen. And Abraham Lincoln once reputedly said, it is better to be silent and be thought a fool than to speak up and dispel all doubt. So we all need to be, in our medical profession, better listeners. We interrupt the patients. We are formulating a differential diagnosis. Let them tell the story. There's a lot of medicine and the accurate, accurate diagnosis in their storytelling. One of the things I'm encouraging house staff and fellows to do is when you go for rounds, whoever's leading the team, sit down. Don't stand at the head end of the bed or the foot end of the bed. You could spend 15 minutes, the patient thinks you gave them two minutes. You were ready to click on your heels and walk away. Sit down. They think you've given them all the time. And at the end, as you're leaving, say to them, I'm privileged to be your clinician. Tell me what I can do 
better to be an advocate for you and your family's well-being. Takes literally 10 seconds, write it down, we'll discuss it next time I'm around. The second attribute of great leaders is that they have empathy and compassion. We were very fortunate to have His Holiness the Dalai Lama as a keynote speaker at a Harvard Med School CME course, and he led a discussion on compassion for three hours one day and the next day on wisdom for three hours. And he truly embodies compassion, wisdom, tranquility, and serenity. And he once said, be kind whenever possible, it is always possible. He also said once, if you want others to be happy, practice compassion. If you want to be happy, practice compassion. In the Talmud it says, compassion is the highest form of wisdom. Now many of you, I think, will be familiar with this individual you see on the screen. Dr. Paul Farmer, a medical anthropologist, he's a university professor, infectious disease, he's a medical student at HMS some 25 years ago, and together with Jim Kim, another medical student, Jim is originally from North Korea, the two of them and their team <clears throat> have provided the most seminal care for the poorest of the poor, the most destitute in Rwanda, in Haiti, in Peru, in Russia, in prisons, prisoners with multi-drug resistant tuberculosis. Paul Farmer got the MacArthur Genius Award and he plowed all half million into his foundation. Jim Kim says, you know, Paul and I are brothers. We love each other, we fight all the time. We just happen to have different mothers. One time they're applying for a grant from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. And after the weekend, Jim Kim walks over and he says, Paul, what are we asking for? Paul said, it's a pilot, I'm, we're asking for 3.2 million. He said, no, I've been thinking about it all weekend. I have a much more robust vision. We're gonna apply for $24.22 million. And they did that and they got the grant. Jim Kim at a very young age became the president of Dartmouth, then he was tapped by President Obama to lead the World Bank. Now Paul Farmer once said the idea that some lives matter less is the root of all that's wrong with the world. His favorite billboard is one which he encountered in Haiti some 20 years ago. And on the billboard it says the only true nation is humanity. This is a patient with end-stage HIV AIDS, literally on his deathbed, a skeleton of a man in Haiti. And Paul Farmer goes, together with Jim Kim, to the pharmacy at the Brigham and Women's Hospital in Boston with an empty suitcase. And they sweet-talk their way into the pharmacist giving them $93,000 worth of antiretrovirals. They fly to Haiti. They administer it to this man, and this is the same individual who's now fully recovered and has this beautiful baby. The story of Paul Farmer's work is told in a wonderful book by Tracy Kidder. Tracy Kidder is a three times Pulitzer Prize winner. And the book is entitled Mountains Beyond Mountains, The Quest of Dr. Paul Farmer, A Man Who Would Cure the World. The third attribute of great leaders is that they have an upbeat, optimistic attitude. This is a true story of a building coming up in Texas, a huge building. This is a newspaper reporter, he has a photographer with him. He's gonna write a story. He sees a laborer with a wheelbarrow full of bricks. He turns to him and he says, sir, what kind of work do you do? And the guy has worked. He says, can't you see I'm carrying bricks on this hot and muggy day? And a few minutes later, there's another laborer similar wheelbarrow full of bricks, and he's whistling and he's smiling and he nods at the newspaper reporter, who in turn again asks the question, so what kind of work do you do? And the guy responds, I'm helping build the most beautiful cathedral in the world. There's a story of a janitor at NASA who was asked the question, what kind of work do you do? You're a janitor? He says, no, no, I'm part of the team that puts astronauts into space to conquer the next frontier. So leaders possess an attitude that is upbeat and courageous. 
So Winston Churchill once said, courage is rightly esteemed, the first of human qualities, because it is the quality that guarantees all others. So great leaders lead with both heart and soul. We now have countries, many countries in the world, where there are tyrants who are ruling. They are leaders without soul. Their countries will be economically, ecologically disadvantaged. They're also spiritually bankrupt. They will emerge free from the morass and the shackles only when an enlightened leader emerges. This is playing out now in North Korea, parts of the Mideast. To some extent, in Burma. We were now called Myanmar. We were very optimistic when Aung Suu Kyi was released from prison. But now there's controversy about the way certain sector of the population has been treated. The D is that great leaders dare to dream big. This also happens to be a story in Texas. Small school, small town, and the teacher gives the 16, 70 year old students in his class, write an essay, assignment. Write an essay on what you want to do when you grow up. This 17 year old boy, whose father had moved from stable to stable, he writes a seven page essay on how he wants to own a 200 acre horse farm. He's got sketches. He's got, talks about nutrition, he talks about pony rides. And with great anticipation, he gives it to the teacher. The teacher calls him two days later and he says, young man, this is a totally unrealistic dream. Nobody in our small town has achieved anything like this. I'm giving you a grade of F. But you're a bright kid, and if you want, you can write another essay. I'll be happy to grade it. So this young man goes home, he talks to his father, and he comes back two days later, and he hands the essay back to the teacher. And he says, you can keep the F. I will keep my dream. And this is the true story. Some 21 years later, at age 38, 39, he has a 172-acre horse farm. And the teacher writes to him and says, can I bring the kids for a picnic to your horse farm? He says, absolutely, you're most welcome. And when the teacher comes in front of the other kids, he turns to this young man and he says, I want to apologize. I was a dream stealer. I shall never do it again. The poet Robert Browning once said, ah, but a man's reach should exceed his grasp or what's a heaven for? And Soren Kierkegaard, the great Danish philosopher and theologian once said, to dare is to lose one's footing momentarily, not to dare is to lose oneself. So great leaders have a compelling vision. They have a dream. They don't think of the obstacles in the way. They inspire their followers. And then they achieve those magical dreams. Lao Tzu once said, a journey of a thousand miles begins with a single step. So I've often been asked, Sanjeev, who comes to your mind? when the word great leader is used, or the leadership moment. And for me, it is unmistakably Mahatma Gandhi. I was born in India a year after he was assassinated. But we learned a lot about him in school. I learned many, many stories from my parents, my grandparents, my uncles who were amazing storytellers. And to me, the seminal leadership moment in the last century was the Gandhi Salt March. So India is under British rule. Salt is plentiful in India, and yet the British have imposed this exorbitant tax. And Gandhi writes to the Viceroy. He says, I consider the salt tax to be the most iniquitous, the most repugnant, the most abhorrent of all the laws that you have imposed in India, on the Indian people. And since India's freedom movement should first begin with the poor, I'm going to conduct the salt march. He's going to walk almost 200 miles. The British miscalculate. Gandhi is 63, he's very frail. They give him permission. Gandhi assembles 77 followers. The youngest is 16. 
He at 63 is the oldest. They have Hindus, Muslims, Christians, the untouchables, the worst caste system in the world. People who can only clean your toilets. And they start to march, and as they march from one village to another village, throngs of people join them. Some 26 days later, he arrives in a coastal village. By many accounts, he puts his hand in the ocean water, he lifts it, there's salt. And he declares, henceforth, we are not going to pay tax to the British on salt. That image captivated the imagination of millions of Amer Indians, but also British parliamentarians, women cotton factory workers in England, leaders in Europe, leaders in America. Over the next six months, there were 5,000 salt marches in India. 100,000 Indians were arrested, jailed, beaten, and some died in prison. But it launched India's freedom movement. Now, if you were to talk to the Martin Luther King Jr.'s, Nelson Mandela's, Aung Su Chi's, the young people of the Arab Spring in Tunisia and Egypt, who's been the greatest inspiration in your life? They all have said Mahatma Gandhi, his life and his teachings. The word Maha means great, Atma means soul. It was a term coined for Gandhi by Rabindranath Tagore, Nobel laureate in literature, after Gandhi's work, 20 years of work in South Africa, fighting discrimination. Now Gandhi once said, there are seven sins. And to me, this summarizes leadership. He said, wealth without work, pleasure without conscience, knowledge without character, commerce without morality, science without humanity, worship without sacrifice, and politics without principle. So great leaders have a work ethic. They have a clear conscience. They have character. They have morality. They serve humanity. They make enormous sacrifices. Gandhi's eldest son rebelled said, you are called Bapu, which in Hindi means father, father of the nation, but you're not a good father to me. And in order to spite Gandhi, he embraced a different religion, started drinking alcohol. Gandhi actually apologized to him. He said, you know, son, I'm not a good father to you. I want to apologize, but I have to do this for India. And great leaders adhere to their principles. Narayana Murthy founded a company called Infosys some 35 years ago in India. He borrowed a piece of jewelry from his wife, Sudha, and he pawned it for $250. And 36 later, years later, this company is worth close to $50 billion. Infosys. Narayana Murthy, very simple man, vegetarian, humanitarian, He's given commencement speeches at Cornell and many colleges in the States. And he once said, people with principles cannot be bullied or pushed around because they can draw clear lines in the sand. The softest pillow is a clear conscience. So great leaders adhere to those core principles. These are Gandhi's worldly possessions. He was eloquent. Masterful. India was importing cotton from England and Egypt. He started the spinning wheel. He said, it is my certain conviction that with every thread I draw, I'm spinning the destiny of India. I happened to hear a one-eye interview with Sir Ben Kingsley. You know, as, as you know, he acted in the movie Gandhi and he got the Oscar. And he was asked, what was the greatest role you have ever played? He said, oh, unquestionably, Gandhi. He said, I immersed myself in everything he did for a year before I first acted in a scene. He said, I tried the spinning wheel. My record was seven minutes before a thread broke. Gandhi's was nine hours. He would be in a zone spinning the spinning wheel. There's a wonderful story about Gandhi this is not a 12-year-old boy in the picture, but the story is about a 12-year-old boy. And the mother walks from a village 20 miles away with her 12-year-old son. She says, Gandhiji, my son adores you. He worships you. 
Look at him. He's gained a lot of weight. He's eating a lot of sugar. Would you please tell him not to eat sugar? So Gandhi looks at the boy, he looks at the mother, and he says, come back in 10 days. So they go away. 10 days later, they trudge in the heat and the dust, walk 20 miles, enter Gandhi's ashram. Gandhi looks at the boy, he says, son, don't eat sugar. It's not good for you. And the boy says, Gandhiji, from this moment onwards, I have given up sugar. And he leaves the room. The mother stays behind. She says, thank you so much for saying that to my son. But can I ask you a question? So he says, sure. We were here 10 days ago. You could have said the same thing to my son then. And Gandhi whispers into her ear, at that time, I had not given up sugar. <laughs> this is leadership by example. This is what Einstein said of Gandhi. You know, at the turn of the last century, Time magazine had a competition. Who are the greatest individuals of those 100 years? And it was Gandhi and Einstein. And Einstein once said, tribute to Gandhi after his assassination, generations to come, it may be, will scarce believe that such a one as this ever in flesh and blood walked upon this earth. Now, the E in the leadership mnemonic is that great leaders are effective. Peter Drucker, the management guru, once said, efficiency is doing things right. Effectiveness is doing the right things. The same thing can be said about the difference between managers and leaders. We need both. You can be an amazing manager, not a great leader. You can be an inspirational leader, not a good manager. So managers do things right. Leaders do the right things. I had a wonderful discussion with Deepak Jain when he was the dean at the Kellogg School of Management at a leadership course. This is about 12 years ago. He subsequently went to INSEAD, also one of the top five MBA programs in the world, and we were trying to recruit him to Harvard Business School. But anyway, I said to Deepak, I said, Deepak, what's the difference between managers and leaders? And he had a very wonderful, simple definition. He said, Sanjeev, Managers are for today. Leaders are for tomorrow. They have a compelling vision about the future. Now, when I think of effective speech, I'm reminded of Sir Winston Churchill. It is said that for a five-minute speech, he prepared for 45 minutes. For a 45-minute speech, he prepared for 15 hours. He would purposely stammer as though he's thinking, meanwhile, he had rehearsed everything. Major General Omar Bradley is reputed to have once said, one speech of Sir Winston Churchill has more might than an entire battalion. And John F. Kennedy, President Kennedy in 1963, bestowed upon Winston Churchill honorary U.S. citizenship. And at the ceremony, he said, Sir Winston Churchill took the English language and mobilized it into battle. And here's an example of his oratory. He said, we are resolved to destroy Hitler and every vestige of the Nazi regime. From this, nothing will turn us. We will never parley. We will never negotiate with Hitler or his gang. We shall fight him by air, by land, by sea, until with God's help, we had rid the earth of his shadow and liberate its people from his yoke. But this begs the question, was Hitler a great leader? And to my consternation, many times when I've given this talk, somebody in the audience raises their hand, and he or she says, Adolf Hitler. And you'll be shocked to know that at the end of the last century, when Time magazine had that competition, and Gandhi and Einstein were the greatest leaders, there were a number of people who nominated Hitler, including one of our governors from one of our states. But in the same issue of Time magazine, Elie Wiesel, Holocaust survivor, professor at Boston University, he died recently, amazing individual, wrote a small piece. And he said, the fact is that Hitler was beloved by his people, not by the military, not at least in the beginning, but by the average Germans who pledged to him an affection, tenderness, and a fidelity that bordered on the irrational. 
His kingdom collapsed after 12 years in one of the most atrocious, brutal, and deadliest wars in history, but which by the same token allowed several large and legendary figures to emerge. They include Eisenhower, de Gaulle, Montgomery, Zukov, and Patton. But when later we evoke the 20th century, amongst the first names that will surge to mind will be that of a fanatic with a mustache who thought to reign by selling the soul of his people to the thousand demons of hate and of death. So he may have been charismatic, he may have been a fiery orator, he had all of Gandhi's seven sins and more. In my book, and I think in your book, we would not call him a great leader. It turns out followers look for four things in leaders. Stability, empathy, trust, and hope. Napoleon was once asked to define a leader. He said it's very simple. A leader is a dealer in hope. So the enlightened leaders lead in that fashion. They're stable, they have empathy and compassion, you can trust them. If I say Eric is a trustworthy person, it's like the highest compliment I've paid him. Praiseworthy, talent, lots of people have lots of talents. The other way some people lead is through fear mongering. That's what the Hitlers and the Stalins of the world did. So this was May 8, 1945, Victory in Europe Day. Churchill is standing at a balcony, and a throng of people collect below, and he gives a short impromptu speech. This is your victory. I'm not going to read the rest. But the moment he had finished the first sentence, that the crowd below erupted and shouted back, no, it is yours. This was the perfect leadership moment, the moment where leader and followers are united in purpose and values. Now here's a visionary leader from the very poor destitute country, used to be East Pakistan, it's now Bangladesh. It gets more than its share of earthquakes, cholera, typhoons, cyclones. He's an economist. Some 30 some years ago, he's going in a Jeep through a very poor village and he meets a lady by the name of Sufia Begum. She worked 10 to 12 hours a day, made bamboo stools and made two cents a day. He said, I was shocked. In my university courses at Dhaka, I'm theorizing about sums in the millions of dollars. Here, before my eyes, the problems of life and death were posed in terms of pennies. He then comes across 41 other women, together with Sufia Begum, 42. In aggregate, they own the moneylenders $27. The money lenders are charging them 200% interest. They're making two cents a day. They're never going to be able to pay off that loan. So he goes to the bankers and he says, why didn't you give these poor people a loan at a decent rate? No interest. So he started his own bank, the Grameen Bank. In the last 30 some years, they've given away more than $100 billion in loans. They have a greater than 99.6% return rate. If a woman gets a loan, $100, four of her friends pledge that they will help support this woman return the loan. This is the concept of microfinance. There are women, fisherwomen, catching fish in a small village. They have cell phones. <laughs> They're negotiating the catch of the fish with the merchant in Dhaka. Get rid of the middleman. They're sending their kids to school. Rickshaw wallas, paying off their rickshaw cycle sending kids to school. This has been adopted in 70 countries, including ours. So Mohammed Yunus got the Nobel Peace Prize, and in the citation it said, he has shown himself to be a leader, to translate visions into practical action for the benefit of millions of people, not only in Bangladesh, but also in many other countries. You know, King Solomon the Wise once said, where there is no vision, the people perish. We need visionary leaders, we need them all over the world, but particularly in those very poor, destitute countries. So great leaders reflect on key events in their life. Sometimes it's a very jolting, negative, stark moment, but it is momentous. 
And then that person has the courage, the fortitude, the grit, the compassion, the love to say, you know what, this is unacceptable. I'm going to try and make a difference here. They start small and the next thing, 40 years later, they're still at it. They're the happiest people on this planet. Mark Twain once said, the two most important days in your life are the day you're born and the day you find out why. Great leaders have a very clear sense of the purpose of their company and their own purpose in life. The Buddha once said, every life has a measure of sorrow. Sometimes it is this that awakens us. Rumi once said, the wound is where the light enters you. Now, I'm very fortunate to call this person you see on the screen as a friend, a mentor, and somebody who inspires me every single day with the work he does. I actually met him at Kellogg at a leadership course about 12 years ago. His name is Jaime Aramillo. He's from the country Colombia, but he's a national hero, hence the term Papa Jaime. He's about 69, some 52 years, 42 years ago, at age 27, he's standing at a street corner in Bogota. And across the street, there's a sewer. There's an underground city. These orphans live there. There's a seven-year-old beautiful girl standing there and looking at him and smiling. As they're having this interchange, a car comes around the corner, stops in the middle of the street, window rolls down, somebody tosses a toy, the car recedes. It's a yellow school bus, Fisher-Price toy. The seven-year-old girl has never possessed a toy. She comes running to the middle of the street, picks up the box. She's looking at Jaime Aramillo, smiling. And as they're having this interchange, a speeding truck comes around the corner, smashes her into oblivion. And he says to himself, this is it. This is my calling in life. I'm going to adopt these kids. He has adopted, house schooled, and fed 52,000 children. National hero. He said, Papa, how do you pay for it? He said, Sanjeev, I have a staff of 150. I have a bakery. The only thing we make is cookies. I've convinced all the restaurants in Medellin, Bogota, to have a cookie jar next to the cash register as people are leaving. They grab a cookie. There's a shoebox with a slit. They drop change, a dollar. I get 50% of my needs that way. I said, that's amazing. What about the other 50%? He said, I'm a motivational speaker. I speak all over Latin America. I plow my honorarium into my foundation. So I said, Papa, come on. That doesn't cut it. I know what motivational speakers get. So he looks at me, he smiles, he says, you're right. Sanjeev, every time I need money, out of the blue, somebody helps me. He says, I'll give you an example. Three weeks ago, I needed 41,000 US dollars to pay my bills, I go to three banks, they turn me down. They said, Papa, we love the work you do, but you already got loans with us. In fact, at a rate, don't even tell anyone. So he says, I'm coming back to the office, and there's a street woman. She looks at him, says, Papa Jaime, crosses the street and gives him a hug. He turns to her, he says, are you hungry? She says, yeah. He says, come, come to the office. So she's sitting in his office, having coffee and eating cookies, and he's on the phone calling three other bankers. And she can tell that he's being turned down. So she looks at him, says, Papa, how much money do you need? He says, Sanjeev, I told her I need 41,000 US dollars. He says, she looks at me, she smiles, she says, Papa, I give it to you. He says, Sanjeev, I said to myself, she's cuckoo. She's a street woman, 41,000 dollars. She opened her purse, she had $60,000. Son had sent her the money to get off the street. She had to sign a piece of paper, move into her house. She says, I've saved some other money. I can move later. You need it, your children need it. Take it now. No questions asked. You can return it if you want, when you want. So that kind of thing happens to me all the time. The next moment, he showed me the photograph of a young lady with third degree burns on the entire left side one of his new orphans. They're told not to leave the orphanage. She left, she was begging outside a fancy restaurant. The restaurant owner called the police. It was not the police, but a death squad that showed up, put her back in the gutter and torched her. He rescued her, 17 reconstructive surgeries. 
get schooled, comes to our country on a computer sciences scholarship, is back home, is married. And he showed me that photograph 10 years ago, three-year-old. He said, that three-year-old is my grandson, plays with my biological grandchildren. Next moment, he showed me the photograph of a young man dressed in impeccable white with a tennis racket, flanked by Pete Sampras on one side, Agassi on the other, one of his orphans, who's now the junior national champion of tennis in Colombia. His orphans have grown up to become nurses, teachers, lawyers, doctors, surgeons, and many of them are giving back to the foundation. You look at his eyes, you'll see the bliss in his eyes. He's one of the happiest people on this planet. But he found his purpose in life 42 years ago, witnessing the tragic death of that beautiful seven-year-old orphan. So great leaders possess a sense of purpose. Now here's a young lady. She's 16 years of age. Do you know her name? Sure somebody does. She's from Sweden. She has autism. She has convinced her entire family to become vegan. And she is standing against global warming. She has been nominated for the Nobel Peace Prize. If she gets it, she'll be the youngest ever. Malala was 17. Greta Thunberg. She has spoken at TEDx. She has spoken at the UN Climate Change Conference, the World Economic Forum. Because of her, on March 15th, just recently, in 100 countries, children did not go to school. And they marched to create awareness about global warming and climate change. Very inspirational leader. You can just Google, listen to some of her interviews and talks. What profound, committed wisdom. So great leaders have humility. Sir Edmund Hillary from New Zealand, the first person to climb Mount Everest with the Sherpa Tenzing Norgay. <clears throat> and he was asked, what was the crowning achievement of your life, being the first person to climb the tallest mountain in the world. He said, no, I was an average bloke. It was the media that transformed me into a heroic figure. But as I learned through the years, as long as you don't believe all that rubbish about yourself, you won't come to much harm. He said, all I did was leave a footprint on a mountain. When he came down, he turned to the Sherpas and he said, what can I do for you? And they said, build schools and clinics for the poor people of Nepal. And he devoted most of his life to that. Himalayan Trust, Everest Foundation. He said, that has given me more satisfaction than a footprint on a mountain. He also once said, it is not the mountain that we conquer, but ourselves. You conquer your fear, your doubts, you can achieve anything. Many great leaders possess a sense of humor. Benjamin Disraeli and William Gladstone were successive prime ministers in England, arch rivals. There's an article in the newspaper and it talks about misfortune. Prime Minister Disraeli uses the word. Next day, a woman reporter says, Prime Minister Disraeli, what's the difference between misfortune and calamity? And without skipping a beat, he says, well, if Gladstone were to fall into the Thames, that would be a misfortune. But if someone were to drag him out, it would be a national calamity. And Gandhi, once after a beating of thousands of Indians and some deaths, asked by a Western reporter, Gandhiji, what do you think of Western civilization? Gandhi said, wow, this is going crazy. <laughs> he said, I think it would be a good idea. What do you think of Western civilization? So, <laughs> I didn't advance. Could you advance it for me from the back? Great leaders have integrity. Heraclitus, the great Greek poet and philosopher, was known for his pithy comments. One of the most famous quotes is, no man steps into the same river twice. The river has changed, the man has changed. This is one of his longest ones. 
The soul is dyed the color of its thoughts. Think only on those things that are in line with your principles and can bear the full light of day. The content of your character is your choice. Day by day, what you choose, what you think, and what you do is who you become. Your integrity is your destiny. As a physician, as a clinician, as a group, as an institution, as a division, a department, as a company, you can do things great for 30, 40 years. You compromise your principle one day, will tarnish your reputation, lose your integrity. And finally, great leaders pack other people's parachutes. Thank you. So this is Captain Charlie Plum. I've had the good fortune of meeting him on several occasions. And his story is that he's sitting in a diner some 40 years ago with his wife. And there's a guy sitting two rows away, and he keeps glaring at him. After a while, he walks over. He says, you Captain Charlie Plum? Captain Plum looks over, and he says, sure am, sir. He says, you flew F-4 Phantom jets off the Kitty Hawk during the Vietnam War. Captain Plum says, that's all true. He says, you were shot, you ejected, you were captured, you were a prisoner for a war for six years, and you were tortured. So Captain Plum looks up, he says, that's all true, who are you? And the guy says, I packed your parachute. So Captain Plum gets up, he says, oh my God, I've been meaning to look for you. You can tell it worked, I'm alive. Tell me something, do you keep track of everyone's parachute you've packed? And the guy says, no, sir. It's enough gratification for me to know that I have served. Captain Charlie Plum was 24 years of age, marries his high school sweetheart. Off he goes at the Annapolis Naval Academy. Off he goes to Vietnam. He's done 75 successful sorties. It's his last one, 76th, and he's coming back in four days to his bride. He's shot, he's captured, he's tortured. He's in an eight-foot infested cell. He's getting infections. He's depressed. This is not my war. This is my president's war. I was going home to my bride. And one day he thinks he hears a cricket chirping in the corner of the cell. So he goes to investigate. It's not a cricket. It's a piece of wire scratching the concrete floor through a hole in the wall. So he pulls on it. There's a tug. He lets go. It disappears. It reappears two hours later with a piece of toilet paper. Says, I'm a fellow prisoner of war. Memorize this code. Swallow the toilet paper. Stop feeling sorry for yourself. It's a fatal disease. It's called victimitis. You and I will survive. There were 180 US elite fighter jet pilots in this prisoner of war camp. One day as he's looking through a crack in the cell, he sees a new prisoner sitting on a stool, white hair being cropped. Senator McCain was in the camp. There's one other guy. He's a midshipman, 21 years of age. He slipped, he fell in the water, he was rescued, he was drowning, and brought to this camp. They're actually making fun of him. What speed and what altitude were you when you fell? And two years later, the Vietnamese, in order to get some good public relations, say to this midshipman, you're the one guy who didn't drop bombs on us, you can go home. And he's very naive, he says, I'm part of the team, if you release me, you have to release everyone. So, of course, they scoff, and the guy who connected with Captain Charlie Plum turns to him and says, listen, young man, I'm the senior most commandant in this camp. Take my marching orders and go home. And this is the most amazing part of the story. In those two years, this midshipman has memorized the names, the names of the first of kin and the addresses of the other 180 U.S. fighter jet pilots, prisoners, singing songs in his head. 180 people, first of kin, addresses. Then on his own accord, he crisscrosses the country, goes to the homes, meets about 70% of them, others have moved, says, your husband is alive, your father is alive. He was the ultimate parachute packer. So for me, parachute packing is a metaphor for nurturing mentoring. Each one of you is here today because somebody packed your parachute. Could have been a father, a mother, a sibling, an aunt, a teacher, a neighbor, maybe more than one person. And our job, your job as leaders, is to pack other people's parachutes. Share your talents, share your wisdom. Voltaire once said, every man is guilty of all the good he did not do. But my other plea 
is to thank people who packed your parachute, especially if they're alive. Don't wait for the eulogy. I did this about eight years ago, wrote to nine of my professors who nurtured and mentored me, and it was an amazing experience, but the reaction I got from them was even more heartwarming. So leadership is a marathon journey, not a sprint. Along the way, there can be many a heartbreak hill. Let me offer you my definition of leadership. Leadership is the ability to articulate a vision and walk the path such that it inspires people to rise above the banality and strife of their common day existence and achieve a higher and common goal. We've talked about these 10 tenets of leadership, including integrity, ideas, imagination, packing other people's parachutes. You know, Einstein once said, imagination is more important than knowledge. Knowledge is limited. Imagination encircles the world. He said, knowledge will take you from A to B. Imagination will take you anywhere. Many other inspirational leaders, an amazing book by Doris Kearns Goodwin, historian, I happen to know her, acquaintance in Boston, a team of rivals, all about Abraham Lincoln's amazing leadership. Many other leaders, look at Nelson Mandela, 27 years in prison, harbored no resentment. Asked if he harbored resentment against his captors, he gave the most eloquent answer. He said, I have no bitterness, I have no resentment. Resentment is like drinking poison and then hoping it will kill your enemies. He said, as I walked out the door towards the gate that would lead to my freedom, I knew if I didn't leave my bitterness and hatred behind, I'd still be in prison, right? The prison of the mind. So many other inspirational leaders, many of them, all of them on this slide, women. Women tend to be very much more nurturing. There's a wonderful book by Helen Fisher, anthropologist at Yale. It's called The First Sex, The Natural Talents of Women and How They're Changing the World. Countries like Norway have promulgated laws that every major board, at least 40% representation has to be women. I'll conclude with a quote from Soren Kierkegaard, who said, if I were to wish for anything, I should not wish for wealth and power, but for the passionate sense of the potential. For the eye, whichever young and ardent sees the possible. Pleasure disappoints, possibility never. And what wine is so sparkling? What's so fragrant? What's so intoxicating as possibility? So leadership opportunities abound. One can lead at many Levels, journey of a thousand miles begins with a single step. You on my leadership doesn't have to be daunting audacious like Papa Jaime or Muhammad Yunus or many other people. It's a very beautiful parable about this young girl who's walking on a beach where there are 10,000 staff is stranded. She picks one, twirls it, throws it into the ocean, does the same thing with another starfish. There's an old man sitting in a rocking chair, smoking a pipe, reading a book. He says, young lady, young lady, come here. What are you doing? Do you think you're making a difference? 10,000 starfish stranded here. Look at that beach across, 15,000. So she picks a starfish, twirls it, throws it into the ocean, turns to the old man and says, it made a difference to that one. We can all make a difference. So many, if not all of you, have already led and done so with great distinction. I invite you to take a moment, reflect on it, then go tell your story. Each one of you has the spark of leadership within you. Keep it ignited. Thank you very much.